Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You've reached the No Name Cinema Society, the film review show that tries to dig a little bit deeper. It is episode 69.2. It's our indie spotlight. And as usual, we're looking at indies from five years ago. And even though it's officially 2022, we're still in our 2021 season. So we're looking at one last indie from 2016, the German indie Tony Erdmann from director Marinade. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler, one of your hosts here at my home in Los Angeles. We're reviewing a German film, so I've got my Bayern München hat on. I got a Bayern München jersey in the background, and Luke Skywalker as well, because he too has some daddy issues. Speaking of daddy issues, ladies and gentlemen, my co host for the evening. First, my silly, enigmatic father who wears wigs, fake teeth, and rubber noses, Max Fano, is here. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello, Max. Welcome. And also my workaholic, overanxious son climbing the corporate ladder in Romania, Devin Michaels is here. This is the one time that I am climbing the corporate ladder in my life. <laughs> and he doesn't like it. I'm very uncomfortable. <laughs> Speaking of uncomfortable, it's a terrible segue, but here's the schedule for this that has been our 69th series of episodes. Started this past Thursday with our current feature. Tonight, of course, is our indie spotlight. And this upcoming Thursday will be our classic movie discussion of The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer. And Devin will be back with me next Monday for our 53rd sound off in which he's going to do his diatribe. I have a societal announcement and I am going to count down my top five father daughter films of all time based on tonight's discussion of Tony Erdman. So guys, that's the schedule for this, our 69th series of episodes. Who's drinking with me? I got Elysian Space Dust IPA. I feel like I've had that for like a lot of episodes recently. Max, what do you got there? I've got a shot of this is that sake uh it's not sake it is the korean drink um what's the name of the korean drink i don't know me. what the name of the korean drink is it's great <laughs> <laughs> let's stupid just call white it man. great whatever it is i'm drinking to a stupid white man devin what are you drinking a little bit of coffee left over from earlier today no good devin doesn't get the cheers with us max cheers to you and cheers to the audience here Cheers is the you. drinking slide for those of you that like to play the drink game along with us. You, the fans, sent in these things that you drink to when we do them on the show. First, whenever Max does mime or a funny voice. Oh, and of no. course, whenever Devin says, there's something about. Cheers to you with some soju. I remember the name. All right, it's time for trivia. What I said on our last indie, which uh, was a review of the film Other People, is I said our final indie of our seventh season will bring us to Germany, a film that also made my top 10 films of 2016 and was the first film ever directed by a woman to win Best Picture at the European Film Awards. Of course, that director is the aforementioned Maren Ade. She also won Best Director at the European Film Awards of 2016, and the film won Best Actor and Actress as well, those same awards. Tony Erdmann was also nominated for the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film. It lost to The Salesman, the Iranian film from director Asghar Fahadi. Ade, incidentally, is a producer on the 2021 film Spencer, which is getting some Oscar buzz of its own. She has not directed anything else since Tony Erdmann, and at press time has nothing announced in the pipeline or anything like that. So guys, that is the trivia for this episode of Tony Erdmann. You ready for summary? Let's do it. Tony Erdmann. When Winfred's dog dies, he decides to surprise his businesswoman daughter with a visit to Romania, where she works as a corporate consultant to ascertain if she's actually enjoying her high-end, high-pressure, high-rolling lifestyle, and he intends to do so by whatever means necessary. As with all of our indies, we do them a little different. So we, one of us uh, recommends the indie uh, and sort of presents it to the other, um, almost like a dissertation. Um, and uh, as with all the indies we've discussed this year, this film made one of our top 10 lists back in 2016. And for the fourth time this year, it was on my top 10. I just happened to see a lot more indies than the other guys. Um, and as it happens, Tony Erdman was my number 10 film of 2016. So instead of me presenting it to you now, let's go back to February 2017, our top 10 films of 2016. And here's what I had to say about it that night. Well, I'm going to do my number 10 now. And originally I had, like, up until like a couple hours ago, I had a very small African film in here that, that, that was a super sweet film, but I couldn't in good conscience suggest that it was more accomplished than this film. This is Tony Erdman, and director Martin Ada. She executes several long, uncomfortable, funny sequences aided by the great work by this actress here, Sandra Huller, bottling up her rage and horror and embarrassment, especially in public. In spite of all the laughs, there's more at work here in this German film that challenges our concepts of success, work-life balance, and of course, uh, family. 
so that's my number 10. I didn't get a chance to see it, um, although, I, again, I wanted to. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things about it. I know it was David Joe's, I think, number one from this year. Uh, no, I, uh, I did not like this movie at all. I did love the scene that you just showed, though. That was a great scene. Uh, but generally not, I disagree. <laughs> can you tell me one thing that you find wrong with Tony Erdman? Yeah, it's all right. Well, uh, I can tell you a bunch that I, I find wrong with it. I, <laughs> I thought it was way too long. I thought it was not particularly funny. It's a comedy that's not funny and it's super long. It's really not good. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I'll, most people love it. And most, it got really well reviewed. It wasn't for me. And I thought that the one scene was just sort of bizarre and, and gross and had no point. Um, gross. But, it's about a woman's breakdown. Jay Money, you're going to have to break this tie. I'm going to vote for Tony Erdman already. It just sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I stand by what I said back then. I'm still amazed Davey missed the boat on this one. One thing I would add uh, after watching it again last night is how wholly unique the film feels to me. It's humor and heart both feel original and alive. I'll dig in deeper on those things shortly. But first, let's hear from these kids. My first question for you guys is, did anybody had you heard of or seen the movie before having to watch it for tonight? Yes, no. no. Never heard of it, even though it was no, Oscar nominated. No. Okay, very cool. Um, I, mean, so that I brings vaguely it... remember the title. That's about it. Vaguely remember the title. All right, now it's time for opening thoughts. Now, the last couple shows that Max and I have been on, we've sort of, you know, missed each other. Like, we've, we've been having this difference of thresholds as relates ambiguity in films. And, you know, some of the films I like were not ambiguous enough for him. I'm paraphrasing. You have to watch some of those episodes. But with that in mind, Max, did I do a better job in this time? Putting opening it thoughts. lightly. Putting it lightly. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> what a, what a great opener. Uh yeah, this this movie was fantastic. Uh, I thought and I totally agree with you. Nailed it. I got one that Max likes. Woo. Yes. Feel good about Woo. that. All right. Good opening thought. And a very brief. Let's see if Devin could also be brief. One sentence or less. How'd you feel about Tony Erdman? It's a wonderful film. Yes. More <laughs> brevity. I love it. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so great. Now I could go in the, I, I had a hard time deciding what direction, because we always try to start with what the, the, the strongest element is. Um, and I had a hard time deciding because I like things about each element. Um, all of us know, our, our, we all know my buddy, Nick Danger. Uh, Max certainly knows him. And, uh, oh, yes. As in Nick Bernadine. This was actually his favorite film of 2016. And he named both of these actors as best actor and actress of the year. For me, I, of course, had Rebecca Hall as Best Actress for her work in Christine, as we talked about in episode 65.2. But I did have Sandra Huller in my top five and was Oscar-worthy in my estimation. So I am going to start with performances um, because I do think they're both extraordinary. But mainly, as I said in the clip, Sandra Huller. To me, it's a brave, fearless performance that communicates so much with so little. Whether it's the moments when she scolds her father with a glance or the moments where she surprisingly lets her guard down or the moments where she falls apart before our very eyes, it's all done on tone in a subtle, controlled, carefully executed manner. I think she's amazing, Devin. What do you think? Absolutely impeccable what she does. Anytime she's on screen, something interesting is happening. And she's telling the story even when the screenplay is, is taken a back seat and just letting her tell the story with her eyes and getting to that next step of her character's progression with wherever she is on this path. And it's so clear and there's always something going on. And I agree with you that it's not just the performances, but if I had to choose one of the elements, the performances make this film rise to this extremely high level, I think. And eventually landed that there because I can't actually find a real bump or flaw with with any of them at any point you know i might have some quibbles on direction or screenplay small stuff that's why i sort of defaulted to performances as the top element because i can't find anything wrong with them it's a rare show where we've got two actors on the same show so we've got you know the tv star and uh devin and the enigmatic uh super talented fifth best actor in los angeles max here what did you think about sandra Huller? I would just like everyone to note that I've been demoted from fourth to fifth. Did you used to be fourth? But that's okay. That's okay, I forgot, man. Actually. You know, every day is a new day. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, Devin put it really well. I totally agree. I kind of thought Huller was constantly pushing against the the story and the direction of her character and the sort of inevitable realization that 
I'm working too hard as a, as a workaholic. Of course, I'm going to become liberated from the dogma of work. She pushes against that with everything she's got. There's constant ambivalence on her part about what she's doing in a good way. Don't take the word ambivalence as like, I don't care about what's going on. It was just wonderful because it, it felt like she was alive each moment. It didn't feel like we were being spoon fed anything. She's able to play both sides, which I think is what Max, you're saying, right? She's able to play loving and caring for her father and wanting the relationship to, to be better than it is, but then also not having the bandwidth to deal with him at all, the way she's currently approaching her life. She is playing both of those, but in any given moment, she is very specifically playing only one of those two, because, you know, we really can only play one thing at a time when it really comes down to it. And it's the specificity of each of those choices. And it changes second by second. Every single scene, I think, has moments in it when she's playing both sides of that general objective or that general stance towards her father or towards herself. Um, but she's, she's constantly specifically choosing one of those perspectives several different times in a scene that just makes it ooze reality and 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 ooze this very relatable human experience of of how we go through our lives and how we navigate our our closest relationships even when they're estranged or half estranged so moving on to the other lead, Peter Simonashek, who plays the father in this movie, also very good, uh, albeit in the seemingly more fun role, in spite of all the antics, uh, his moments of guilt, mild regret, pondering, or honesty, I think are among the film's best, even if they are fleeting. I think it's a terrific performance, and he won a bunch of awards as well. Max, tell me about Peter Simonashek. Peter Simonashek also just kind of blew me away. He shows his cards more. As a performer, it's, it's very clear he has an intention and a goal, and that's wonderful. He's able to be uncomfortable so well. It feels very alive, very in the moment, very real. I also think uh, Hüller kind of stole the show, but he was yes. great. I'd sort of agree with that. And like I said, I had her as a top five actress in 2016. In terms of him being clear about his emotions, I think that fits for the character, you know what I mean? And sort of the difference between them. 100%. One other small point about the father, I thought there was something fascinating. And towards the beginning of the film, he's meeting various folks and he kind of blurts out a line. His response to his own statement was visible in his face and in the sort of posture of his body where he was sort of like, okay, I just said that. Let's see how this is going to go. Is that really what I'm experiencing now? It was, it was very interesting and I, I can't remember the line, but it was so alive. So in the, in the present, you know, I, I felt his uncomfortableness from that. Both of them did great body work. You know, it was a full performances, head to toe, not just the line delivery and the choices, but their full gait, G-A-I-T, obviously, you know, was Excellent was nose terrific. work as well. I was hoping you were going to wear your fake teeth and rubber nose to fit in oh, for tonight, but... Uh, you can't have it all every time, man. That's Devin, why you, you were demoted get... from fourth to fifth. Devin, you nailed it. You didn't yes. have your props. Speaking of nailed it, uh, Devin, you haven't talked about Peter Simonashek yet. I think he did nail it. If you're analyzing a performance like this, I think you have to look at both the macro and the micro. He aced both. In terms of the macro, the way he plays against the story and with the story, in lesser hands, this could have been very obviously one way where he is so sure that he knows how to live life and she doesn't, uh, and that would have been not as interesting, or the other extreme, where he's playing his insecurity that he never had the success that she seems to be having and he doesn't know what he's exactly been doing with his life, you know. And neither of those would have been that interesting. But instead, he's this very real in-between. He doesn't have all the answers, but he certainly knows enough to know that she is off the rails. And he knows enough to know that he wants to change that. And to look at his micro, an example that I wrote down was this little subtle moment pretty early on, basically when he's first on screen with her. And it's so clear how instantly less confident he is the moment she's within 10 feet of him and all the different levels and all the insecurities about what she does and what he hasn't done, how he struggles to relate to her. All those different ways that he can be playful and feel himself and feel confident, it all just evaporates in this 
so clear, but you know, beautifully subtle way at the same time. I thought that was amazing. Yes, I want to want to put a pin in that because that leads to some things I want to say later. And I I don't want to argue this point fully now, but I I agree with you in the ways that they are the same. But I also something I want to bring up later is the ways in which they are polar opposites, which I do think exists, and I will talk about later. But I just want to. Uh, mention that because you mentioned that thing and I just want to respond to it now and so the audience knows to tune in later for the rest of that. I'm going to move on to the screenplay. First and most importantly, as far as that's concerned, I just really like the story, the plot, the characters, relationships. There's a lot of detail that all feels organic, interesting, vivid, and real. What struck me most about the script, however, is the structure. On some of the Hitchcock films we reviewed in the show, Vertigo, North by Northwest, Psycho, we've discussed how some scripts switch perspectives midway through. But this film does it several times. A lot of times, a film that has two protagonists like this one sort of does will cross cut between them almost evenly. This film spends about 45 to 50 minutes from his point of view, then switches completely and might I add seamlessly to her perspective for another 45 minutes and then back to him, then back again. If someone pitched that concept to me as a structure, I might have raised an eyebrow. I find it kind of counterintuitive, but I think it works extremely and surprisingly well in managing to juggle both of their journeys. So that's what I have to say about the screenplay, guys. Devin, what do you think? I completely agree. I was surprised at how well it navigated that shifting perspective and how well it navigated its own length. It didn't feel like any of those scenes were superfluous. Another impressive thing about the screenplay, it expertly weaves through these themes of globalization, class issues into Did this- Did Devin jump into the T word early? I'm, Can't stop him. I mean, we, we can, we can, we'll talk more fully about that later, but I, I just think screenplay wise, the fact that it was able to infuse this very personal narrative and weave these larger themes in there really perfectly in a way that it never felt heavy handed in the slightest, that that was an amazing achievement when she's messing up with the CEO a little bit by overstating certain things and misnavigating some of his sensibilities. All of her mistakes are her own. If the screenplay were more facile, it would have been, she's there being so sharp because she's Miss Workaholic. And then the father does something goofy that then gets her in trouble. And it wasn't that at all. It was just him being in the room made her maybe not as sharp. Some specific lines were great. She asks why he didn't tell her earlier about the dog dying. And he just has this great biting response. He says, I don't always have time either. They can be cruel to each other in these little small doses that are very, very relatable. I have two things I need to respond to before I forget them. <laughs> I apologize, Max. I didn't want to just include you, but I'm going to forget these things. Yes, it weaves those themes in. And I, it's actually, and I don't mean to mean this as condescending, it's actually a lot simpler than it seems. It, it, it manages to weave those themes in just by being real and honest. It's a lot more simple than it than a lot of screenwriters might make it. It's amazing to me how infrequent it is to see something balance as many themes as this film does. It does it effortlessly because it's just about grounding the characters and it's just the world. By creating a realistic world, the themes create themselves. And the yeah. second thing, I agree with you that I don't find any of the scenes superfluous at all. However, I do think there are ways that it could have been a little bit shorter and I'll get to that, which I don't think is a screenplay thing. And now that I got that out of my system, Max, screenplay. Ooh. I'm glad you got that out of your system, JB. I hope that feels better. Something you said really resonated, I think, the simplicity of the story, because it made me think it was such a plot driven by the characters that it almost, it, now and then, felt like there was no plot and felt like the action was simply watching these people live. But, but that's it, the goal, you know, is it? To make it feel like it's an honest, real living human being that you're watching? Oh gosh, I hope you're not thinking I was suggesting this isn't cool. It's amazing the fearlessness to pick a scenario that's not necessarily extraordinary. I'm going to pick a father who is goofy, but is not Robin Williams, is not an expert comedian, juggler, his timing isn't impeccable. He's going to do something funny and there's going to be this long beat 
where we all kind of go, that wasn't genius. That was, there was funny. <laughs> Primarily what it had was heart. You mentioned the word fearlessness, and I'm going to come back to that other ways. I, that is a word that I use later in the script. Maybe I'll have to think of a different word so I don't copy you. But yes, I agree with that. Definitely uh, don't copy me. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't. So I am going to move to direction. I mentioned earlier how I think this film is unique, and I think one of the main reasons why is the tone achieved and maintained by director Marin Ade. It's a quite an odd and restrained kind of tone for a comedy. In the clip that I played from the top 10 of 2016, Davy complained about how he hated the film because it just wasn't funny. But I think he was looking for that typical setup, setup, punchline kind of comedy that we as Americans are used to. The film had a more subtle, less manipulative, less condescending approach to my mind. And one of the ways she achieves this is through her blocking choices. Often staging her surprises in soft focus, deep in the background, which you'll miss if you're not paying attention. Max earlier used the word fearless, and so I'm just going to repurpose that word because I do think that's a certain level of fearlessness, especially for not an established filmmaker like Mara and Ada, at least not globally. The father's first appearance as Tony Erdman, for example, is a large bucket of water to the face in a great way, perfectly executed sitting there in the background the whole scene and you're completely unaware of him and he turns around and it's a huge, huge surprise. There's an extraordinary amount of restraint there. Too many directors would be anxious about us missing these things. They feel the need to call our attention to it in some way and so I appreciate the way in which she trusted us. This restrained approach also allowed the space to play, which I think was huge in achieving the performances that we've already commended. The downside to that is it slows down the film a great deal. Frequently, I appreciate how she let the camera linger on its subject for an extra beat or two, but I didn't need it to be every single time. If I have any complaint about the film in that it does wind up being maybe slightly too long, which fans will know it's not something I, I complain about that often. Uh, now, as I suggested to Devin, I don't think any particular scene is unnecessary. I actually think all the scenes and the beats are necessary. And I also admit that the film's best moments and biggest laughs are in its final 40 minutes, so it's worth the wait. But I often talk about the concept of rhythm and release, the balance of speed and breaths. It's a minor thing, but I think there were scenes, especially in the first and second acts, that could have used a little less air, as we say. Not all, just some. Just a little more here and there to tighten it up in an otherwise strong film. So I don't know if that directly disagrees with some of the things you were saying. I mostly agree with you on that. It's a game of inches and there might be a few of those when it lingers that I would want to keep that you would not want to keep. It's obviously very subjective. I mean, it's, I want to keep plenty of them. Yeah, but overall, I agree with you. I think some of those could have been trimmed and, and it still could have kept that same thread, that same tone, even if they had trimmed some, some of those out. But overall, yeah, it's it's a minor quibble. And I think I yeah. prefaced it by saying that it is a minor quibble, but they were supposed to dig deeper on this show. So I'm trying to be fully rounded yeah. in, in my review. And that was one of the things that Davey said in his retort. So I wanted to address that. I have to say that was my one question about the film is, could this be shorter? But I think that would have been a truly difficult task to maintain the tempo, the feeling, the heart of the film, the realism and the dualism of what these characters are going through. The funniest scene of the film, right? The nude party. Davey doesn't been... think that's the funniest scene in the film. <laughs> okay. Well, but that could have been done with the sort of Jennifer Aniston-esque, ooh, and I'm sexy. It kept going against what I'm used to. It really had nothing to do with sex, but then everybody's nude. It obviously wasn't very successful in team building. It showed that she had a certain amount of, of respect from several co-workers regardless. It was a really nice touch that the boss comes around. It was very clear why the assistant was going right. to do it because she's an underling. But the fact that the boss ends up coming back was such a nice communication of trust and respect. Well, I'm going to get back to that as well in our next segment. I did want to tell you guys about my ideas for team building exercises. So guys, let's uh... <laughs> <laughs> on the <All> show. Right. <laughs> oh, yes. Come on, Max. <laughs> Is this for our fan base? Or... <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you there's a million plus people that looked at the running time of this movie and decided not to watch it. And that's absolutely. I, um, and that's part of why I, I agree. If if you get five minutes out of this, suddenly it's 230 something instead of 240 something. I think that that would have been worthwhile, both from a, a marketing point of view and and artistically, it would have still been successful. Yeah. That's, so, that's I mean, I think point. I think there's 
there's slight flat fat to trim without, I don't think you damage the whole thing. It's slight. Like, I just want to reiterate that it's just a handful of moments for me. And it sounds like Devin agrees. Well, uh, quest, question to our resident director, because I, I totally agree with what you both are saying in terms of trimming. And I also agree that the director has the final say, but how much of the, the that edit could be cut down by the editor? Like that- an editor is department head. In a good scenario, it's a collaboration. Every collaboration is different. Usually it goes like this. While the director's shooting the film, the editor is doing what we call an assembly. So they're just basically just putting the scenes together and basically getting a rough idea. Putting the story in order based on the script and the Um, takes that are the best maybe well i mean a lot of times a director will give the script supervisor what's called circle takes so before the even editor gets in they'll get a script notes that say takes one and four are the director's favorite if the editor doesn't love them they're certainly allowed to look at the others you have this assembly with the editor choosing amongst circle takes generally and the assembly is usually like four four and a half hours long or something ridiculous once they have assembly they go through it together director and editor usually just the two of them sitting in a room hashing it out figuring out where to trim from there but yes and been done many many times for an editor sit on their own maybe work a few extra hours and present an option while saving the director's option present a shorter, usually it is shorter from an editor, present a shorter <laughs> option. Normally what happens if it's a good relationship is they'll beat somewhere in the middle. Fair I, enough. Don't, that, I don't know if that was a longer answer than you had in mind. No, that's great because it also says, you know, this may have not been just solely a director's issue. You're absolutely right about that. It is ultimately the director's responsibility or making sure the fat is cut out. So it's time to move on to Max's favorite segment. Max, what's it called? The T word. It's time for the T word. He's not calling a timeout. This is where we talk about the themes of a film. DB, who you saw that clip earlier tonight, used to hate talking about themes. It drove him crazy. So we used to dance around it, calling the T word. And a segment was born. And now it's Devin and Max's favorite segment. And as these guys have suggested all night, there's so much to get into just by recreating reality it finds so much. I have three that I wanted to talk about and we can see our doing on time, see if you guys want to add more. There are obvious pokes at corporate culture. We've already talked about the globalism and the obvious familial dynamics. But as I mentioned in the clip five years ago, the film to me more than anything is about work-life balance. At this point in their lives, the father and daughter in the film represent the polar opposite ends of that particular spectrum. I know they have their similarities, Devin, but on this end, I feel like they're very different. Her journey is the more obvious one, and her ascetic workaholic nature pushes her to the brink of a breakdown. The need for humor, levity, and whimsy in her life is more than apparent. But his journey is slightly more subtle. His irreverence holds nothing sacred. He lies to everyone and everything, partly for his own amusement and partly as a means of communication with his daughter. But there are consequences to that. But that doesn't really land for him until the consequence affects someone else, a random stranger. All this to suggest that neither philosophy is foolproof, but some combination, some balance of the two might be the healthiest way forward. I wish the last scene didn't feel the need to hammer that point home at a certain point. It was asked and answered as far as I'm concerned, but I do appreciate the very, very final moment, which while it acknowledges that change is possible, it also reminds us that change isn't absolute and immediate. It's a process. I got two other things I wanted to talk about. Uh, I don't know who, who wants to go first on work-life balance. It looks like uh, he wants you to go first, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, there was something I was going to bring up earlier when we were discussing the screenplay that I think is directly relevant to that question. When she's meeting with her own coach online, who's coaching her on her in the boardroom and, and, and her body language and all that, mm-hmm. and she brings up, I felt like my body language, I was slipping a few times when I was listening. The coach says, it sounds like you were really listening. That's why you need to stay on your message. That was very, you know, incisive commentary on not just corporate culture, but all of success and all questions about work-life balance and and salesmanship, which we have in, in every corner of our lives. But there's also nothing disingenuous about it. That's something that you're actually told when you do these public speaking coaching things. And in just relating that, she finds something. It's extremely relatable that we're all balancing that all the time, both in our careers and in our personal lives. We hit on that earlier, the idea of neither of them has the answer. Neither of them knows, hey, this is the, the way one should live life. But he does have some extra experience. And so at least he has the extra humility that comes with that experience and the extra ability to live in the ambivalence and embrace the ambivalence 
perhaps in a slightly healthier emotional way than, sh than she's currently doing. And of course, Devin amongst us is the one with the most experience. So of course he would speak to that to some degree. Like experience. experience with ambivalence, yes. <laughs> and he's definitely experienced with ambivalence. <laughs> Max, work-life balance. You know, uh, I, I think, I mean, I think Devin pointed out one of the most poignant moments of the film in terms of work-life balance. Because if you take it as a math equation, right? If you want to be successful, you have to stay on brand or stay on, I forget the word. Message. A message, exactly. You <laughs> see, I was, I was not on message. <laughs> that will lead you to success. And I was able to take that math equation, throw that up on life and go, oh my God. To me, anyway, that's crazy. It was actually put into the dialogue, I think more than once. You know, what's most important to you, I think. If work is the most important thing, then that will lead to potentially staying on message. And if living life that includes words that the father used, like happy, that might include very different things than previewing everything in your mind and trying to live as close to that as possible. It sounds like you mostly agree that that was a large part of the film, Work Like yeah, Talent. Yeah, yeah. It's weird that we're gonna keep talking about that one scene. It actually points to my third theme, so I'm gonna jump ahead because the whole idea of staying on message when you're presenting in the corporate world is about owning your power. That was one of my other themes is I thought occasionally about the power dynamics of the film. For the father, he takes ownership of his power by gleefully being self-aware that he is almost the only one that is in on his jokes in a Kaufman-esque kind of way. And by Kaufman-esque, Devin, I mean Andy and not Charlie. All of Bucharest is his playpen for him to do and say what he likes which gives him a leg up on everyone he encounters. For Ines, her father's antics robbed her of her power and control over situations by throwing her off her guard. And then she takes it out on her lover and her assistant, making sure to exert her control over something, someone, anyone. And then strangely, in her lowest of moments, she stumbles onto the idea that by marching to her own drummer, even in that extreme scenario, she takes back some of that power, even from her own boss. Power dynamics comes up a lot from others on the T word, and I'm not sure it applied to some of the other films in those cases. But I felt like Enos as a character was constantly grasping for power or control and only seems to find it in the moments where she lets go, which to me is an interesting observation. I'm not sure how accurate it is. It did strike me while watching the film that she found power at the moments maybe she least expected it. And I think it speaks to that scene again, because if you're listening to someone, you're giving up your power. I think that's a very interesting take. To the audience knows when Devin says I have an interesting take, he means you're absolutely wrong. That's the subtext. No, no, <laughs> I think that's a very interesting take. And I think that the power dynamic is there. But I also felt that a lot of what you're describing was more about the theme of identity. Damn you, that was one of the themes! And the I, idea, should, I knew I should have gone in order. <laughs> the idea that this painfully human irony that sometimes our disguises are how we become the most free to be ourselves. And this is part of why I felt like it was so interesting to look at the similarities between father and daughter, because they both did that. You know, the same way yeah. he feels freer and more powerful, to your point, by putting on the fake teeth and the other disguises, he feels freer to be himself and more powerful to express himself, to be himself. She's doing the same thing with her corporate blazers, wearing her assistant's blouse because hers got blood on it, all the different disguises she puts on until she just can't take it anymore. And of course does the, the nude party because she's just so tired of putting on all these different disguises to uh, attain the power you're talking about. And you know, it's funny because I was doing the identity theme in my notes and then it made me think about the power. Before Max goes, I'm just gonna tie it to identity so we can all talk about it at once. Um, I, I have identity as my other theme, but a different way than when we talked about it when we did The Lobster in episode 66.2. I thought a lot about how our sense of identity connects to our sense of self-worth. She seems to measure herself by career success, but is she really a blood-sucking corporate vampire in those corporate blazers that Devin mentioned? Or is she simply Enos, Winifred's daughter, or Mrs. Schnook, the assistant to the German ambassador? Along the same lines, is he the German ambassador or is he a middle-aged music school teacher? Or is he Tony Erdmann, life coach to the Romanian rich and famous? Or is he a Bulgarian monster that wards away evil spirits? Whether intentionally or not, both are playing parts 
to the point that they may not be sure anymore what is pretending and what isn't. She does it to avoid drowning in the world she's created for herself, and he does it to stave off ennui as a means to feeling alive. But both might be doing it to avoid thinking about or realizing who they actually are, because that might be the most uncomfortable character of all. So it sounds a lot like what Devin said, and I feel a lot better about my power theme now that it ties to identity. So maybe he really meant it that it was an interesting take. Max, identity and power. So I totally agree with Devin. I um, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, when you bring up power as a theme, I I can see why you'd say that, but I actually think the interesting thing there is you're looking at the film through the guise of Enos's intellectual concept of what's right and wrong, good and bad. Uh, the qualitative experience of living life through Enos's belief system, which is not necessarily who she is, but what she suggests is value. And so therefore you see these situations with this sex crazed assistant I don't think Tim was her assistant. It was a colleague. No, was, I'm uh, sorry, colleague, colleague. You're totally right. We were, we're hoping that the assistant would be sex crazed. <laughs> right. I actually think the father was freely giving up what you would deem powerful in place of a kind of a freedom that comes from releasing your power. I think my argument was when she is more free, theoretically, in the nude scene, she inadvertently becomes more powerful. She takes back the power. I think that's actually not quite right because she says, I don't need to be powerful. And therefore I see that uh, you're right. There is power, but I'm not above anyone at this party. She wasn't the boss. They you were that there's a certain power in that freedom. You're potentially adding the word power because, uh, you know, I think from a Western perspective, that's, I think, valued as if we're free, we're powerful. But actually, I think what the movie kind of suggests is if we're free, we have no need to be powerful. That intakes, especially in relationships with everyone else, gives you back power in the larger scheme of power dynamics. By not needing it in any relationship, whatever, if you find that you stop pushing too hard or caring so much, you yeah. take back some of the power in that relationship dynamic. The same kind of thing in other relationships, you know? Don't get me wrong. I understand what you're saying. I just see that as sort of a Western loop, that perspective, that I don't necessarily think this film was prescribing to, where if you give up your power to therefore become powerful, you're in a way starting from the bottom again. You're now dealing with the fact that you're powerful and or successful. But if you just, if you just give everything up, you know, like the father kept doing, it becomes about something different. That's all I'm saying about that. And I totally think that is connected to identity, which I think is what both of you are suggesting. Knew it would happen at some point. I'm going to heartily disagree with you on uh, on your point. Sorry. I, I No, I mean, like, it's just my perspective. I stick by what I said, and I, I do think power is a part of it. That's what it meant to me. And I actually see where you're coming from, and it totally makes sense. I'm, I'm just suggesting that as a theme, like I think that's maybe a character element that many of the characters share. I just don't see it as a, a theme of the film in the way that identity is, work-life balance, family. The power element is something that the characters, many of them anyway, struggle with and ultimately come to kind of relinquish and get over. But I, I don't think that power affects uh, everyone and everything in the way that identity does and some of the other things. So it's not necessarily that I'm disagreeing with you, JB. I'm just putting it in a different category. I don't agree with you putting it in a different category. And you're welcome <laughs> to. Like, we're all different parts here. But okay, I, well, I'm, fair I'm yeah, sticking to my yeah. guns on this one. I can be convinced in some cases, but not in this one. I, I not, Nothing you said convinced me that it's not a part of the film. I agree that it's related to identity. And I acknowledge that thinking about identity made me think about the power dynamics. But... I do think that it is a theme in the film for me. Yeah, um, I think they, they, they both can coexist. I think the main point that I was gleaning from what Max was saying was that one of the filmmakers' messages is that the power that's being sought is a Pyrrhic victory kind of power. Once you are seeking it that way, you're already kind of losing it, falling into a game that's unwinnable. And the only well, way to win that. is to lose. I mean, that's sort of what I was saying. Well, the re relinquishing the search almost surprisingly gives it back to you. Yeah. I think that's why the two themes connect so beautifully, which I think we all 
are in violent agreement about. <laughs> violent agreement. I love that. We've talked about so much. And a cursory level, we talked about globalism, family, corporate culture. And, and on a grander level, we talked about work-life balance. We've talked about power and identity. Are there other things that you guys wrote down or wanted to talk about? Like it's been a long episode already, but it looks like Devin's nodding. Is there more you wanted well, to add? I'm, I'm done. I would say two small things. There's this one moment when she's just finished her presentation that she was feeling so much stress about. It didn't go poorly, but it didn't go great. Kind of she... like this show, this episode. <laughs> Everyone else has left the conference room. She walks over to the window to make this call and looks down at basically like Romanian villagers. And while she's making the phone call to her, like we were saying earlier, more provincial father, she's looking down at this family that's, you know, running around in the dirt. It's all three classes are represented in a single gesture. Yeah, it's this fascinating juxtaposition of all of that imagery in this understated and yet really clear way that's saying something about all of the things at once. It's saying something about her identity, that she's trying to, to be this corporate powerful figure and she's just sort of half failed. And so she doesn't know who she is. And she's reaching out to her father in whose eyes she's not sure who she is. I think it hits everything at once in that one moment. It's sort of a subset of globalism potentially, but I mean, the class, classicism. Uh, yes, as it were. absolutely. Uh, Max, did you have anything else? Yeah, I mean, I, in, in a way I, I feel like that last moment in the film is very much like the 400 blows francois truffaut where we one of, don't one of the know... films from our 1959 in review that we when we studied 1959 there you go we don't know the future of this character but what we see so clearly i think from that moment is the question of why are we alive and the beauty of not answering that i think is so potent we're constantly reframing everything because the end doesn't come right their experience leads to more experience and the question of what is right and what is wrong is left to kind of linger relating so so much to what you're saying max and i think for me that was speaking to another theme that i considered bringing up which is this idea of just generational inertia the pattern of human experience and and it ties of course directly into the identity theme these characters are wondering who am i yeah. because we are all our parents we are all our grandparents we are all our great grandparents and all the different patterns throughout those generational stories and decisions that have gotten made and thousands and thousands of decisions that have gotten made that have led to us yeah. and the ambiguity the fact that there are no answers well, that's the beauty of a film that doesn't spoon feed you to Max's point and has some open-ended qualities that, you know, we can interpret a lot of similar things and we can also interpret a lot of things different. In the Venn diagram of our interpretations, there's some overlap, but there's also, uh, we're, we're far apart on some things as well. But that's the beauty of it because all that matters is what it means to us as individuals. I think that suggests a good film. Agreed. Double thumbs up. <laughs> so did I, I got this one right, Max? I did okay in my recommendation? What do you mean, man? You're always doing okay, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't be so I, hard I on yourself. Go, go back and look at episode 67.2, Captain Fantastic. We'll see what happens there. I know that Devin was excited to watch that when it came out on November 29th. Would, oh, yeah. Wouldn't it be dreadful if we all agreed on every movie? And 100%, 100% right, 100% right. I, I just know. feel, I just feel like, I feel good. I feel excited that I, you guys said that you had not heard of this movie, like maybe Devin vaguely had heard the title, but had not heard of it. And I recommended it to you and you both had what seems to me extremely positive responses to it. Is that fair to say? Yep. Absolutely. I, I mean, this follows in the, the footsteps of Krisha. I loved that that movie was so imperfect and so damn good, <laughs> you know? That's why we have our indie spotlights to find these little somewhat hidden gems. Time for closing thoughts, Devin. I think we've covered it. I'm I'm appreciative that uh, that you, uh, you know, exposed me to this film. I thought it was terrific. Anything you want to say to Drunk Davey for his reaction to the film? <laughs> I don't understand his perspective on it at all. I, I, I think- <laughs> I didn't either. I think, I think it missed, the point. To Davy's defense, I think we've sort of talked about how we are kind of set up to expect certain things out of comedies. I think to a certain degree, like even Ines's character might have been like, 
that wasn't funny enough. This movie wasn't successful. <laughs> Although I don't agree with that at all, I can kind of see how somebody would walk down that road. Go watch this movie, folks. If we are back for an eighth season, we'll be spotlighting indies from 2017. So it makes sense to begin with the highest indie that ranked on my top 10 of 2017. And for the second time in the last three indies, we'll discuss a film starring an SNL alum, Saturday Night Live. This one written by the Saturday Night Live actor who's actually still on the show. So that's your trivia for the next indie if we are on an A season sometime later this year, April or May. Um, our next show, however, is our classic movie discussion coming up in just a few days. And for the third year in a row, we'll be reviewing a film celebrating its 75th anniversary. It's The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, starring Cary Grant as a bachelor and a teenage Shirley Temple as the titular Bobby Soxer. And that's coming up this Thursday. All right, everybody, say shoes to the audience. Shoes. 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 And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned. Danke.